Welcome to Investories, unlocking the investing mindset and business strategies of high-performing individuals to level up your financial game, crush your goals, and build a life fulfilled. This is the show that asks the questions you wish you knew to ask. This is Investories. Booyah. Welcome to the Investories podcast with me, your host, John Hooper. Hey, how's it going? Welcome back to Investories. Great to have you back. Um, I wanted to talk to you about, uh, about liking, subscribing and following us on our YouTube channel. Uh, there's a link in the show notes and also just sharing this podcast with your friends. I'm, I'm so excited to bring you the, the content we're bringing you and um, I'm going to keep doing it. So that really helps us. So uh, if you can, that's great. And hit us up on social media. Um, we're on Instagram, uh, Investories Pod. Uh, or you can email us at investoriespodcast at gmail.com. And again, I'll put the link to that in the show notes. So you can just click a button and come say hi. Who do you want to see? Who? What do you like? What kind of content do you like? What kind of strategies do you like? Uh, we're going to dive more into the mindset stuff and, and all that good stuff. So anything around that, that that sounds good that floats your boat, let me know. Um, today we've got uh, Mike Margarella. Mike is a uh, private equity um, investor and he's been growing a business um, for for the last few years uh, passive, to, to drive passive investment in in real estate syndications funds that kind of thing so we kind of talked through the fundamentals of that um, how how to get started how he got started a uh, really interesting um, career from from lawyer to um, to a full time investor and uh, you know it's it really dives into that conversation around playing to your strengths so like what are you good at what's your w2 what's your talent and how do you transfer that into um the, the journey of kind of investing the journey of building a business those kind of things so super excited to bring you this this conversation and um check us out next week we've got a huge uh huge conversation with a with a big person in in real estate and I'm really excited to bring you an interview next week as well that's gonna gonna kind of blow uh, blow the socks off and, and really take us up a tier. Um, but anyway, without further ado, uh, please please enjoy this this conversation with Mike. I got a ton out of it, and I hope you guys do too. Welcome to Investories, Michael Margarella. Did I say your name right, Michael? Yes, you nailed it. Yes. Luckily, Michael briefed me before we hit record, so uh, that, that happens a lot. Uh, Michael's from Nextplay Investments, uh, a, a VE firm, I guess is the best way to describe it, right, uh, Michael? No, um, that's exactly right. Storage and multifamily. That's right, yeah. We mainly raise, we mainly raise uh, private capital, uh, private equity, and we deploy that into self-storage and multifamily. So that sounds like really high level or really kind of uh, detailed or, or complex right so let's spin it back because it's because terms like that and stuff like that is for me is scary uh, <laughs> and for our listeners i assume the same um what's your background and, and kind of what was your route into the that side of things yeah sure so uh my background's on the legal side uh, i'm an attorney and uh for years growing up i was on a traditional path of uh, working uh, and, and working a career in law and uh, just thought that that's what the future would hold. And when COVID hit in 2020, I think it reset a lot of folks' expectations, including my own, as to what uh, safe income looks like. And I wanted to diversify where my income came from. So we were more prepared for unprecedented times and economic changes. And so that's when we really... Um, put the pedal to the metal as far as real estate goes. And we started in the residential space and, and eventually scaled into the commercial space. That's really interesting. So that reasoning is, I think this is kind of the newer trend, which is post COVID people kind of got to do a reality check of what was important <laughs> and what they want to be doing as well, which is, is super interesting. How did that manifest in terms of decision-making and education? That was the biggest part I'd say. Um, mindset is is always tough when you come from a place of knowing exactly where your paycheck is coming from on mm -hmm. a weekly, bi-weekly, monthly basis uh, and going into real estate where um, 
you know, it's, it's certainly not predictable like that. So getting over those hurdles was, uh, was a challenge. And I think education played a big part in it. Uh, not knowing what you don't know is always scary. So getting as much education as you can and, and listening to shows like this and, and other real estate podcasts and reading some literature, uh, that was super helpful in ensuring that I felt a bit more confident about what we were jumping into. What did you consume? What was your go-to book or course or podcast? Pretty much everything. So Bigger Pockets, I'd say, is the uh, is the go-to for novices. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's, that's certainly where I started. And that's actually how I got turned on to real estate. So I was just listening to a random Bigger Pockets episode just as I was searching for podcasts that talked about uh, what to do basically with some savings. And that came up and I'd always been interested in the idea of real estate. And when I listened to the podcast, it just made so much sense. And I was hooked mm -hmm. after one. And I said, this, I don't understand why everybody doesn't do this. Yeah. And I, I think I've described it as I see it like I surf occasionally and it's like you're on a, like the wave needs to build. And as it builds, it kind of pushes you forward. And I feel like it's that hopefully it doesn't kind of blow out the other end and, <laughs> and crash onto the shore, but it's almost that the bit I find exciting is that sustained kind of small growth to start with and then the exponential growth. Um, obviously what you guys are doing is, is massively scaling that. Take me back to that first deal. What did that look like? Yeah, the snowball effect is real. So that's a really good analogy. And I think uh, we started on the smaller side. Our, our first deal was a residential flip in Indianapolis. So it was an out-of-state flip. Uh, and at first, we were interested in the residential space, that, that one to four family, uh, mainly on the buy and hold side. Uh, but we just couldn't find deals that we felt penciled out there. So we, we went to flipping just to kind of get active, make some connections. And, and like I said earlier, uh, that just wasn't the scale that we wanted. It weren't moving at the velocity that we wanted. The deal size wasn't quite what we wanted. Uh, so that, so then we moved into commercial. And, and as you said, I mean, that, that wave effect, that snowball effect is real. You do a deal, you do a couple deals. And all of a sudden, you know, I don't want to say you don't have to do anything because that's just not true. But if you put in the effort and you're doing uh, and you're moving forward, whether that's through deals or otherwise, there's just a lot of things that start to line up. More deals get presented to you, more opportunities. Uh, and so, you know, that's been huge, just riding that momentum in the last few years. Yeah. And you get that muscle memory, right, of what looks good, what doesn't look quite so good and you start to kind of think oh, okay this there's a bit of a sense to it rather than just crunching numbers and hoping um yeah. so that that's super interesting and the uncomfortable gets a bit more comfortable yeah there you go i like that <laughs> i like that so what was the first thing you guys bought uh it was just a residential flip in india oh it was what so the flip process i'm kind of cautious and i'm not very practical so that i find that terrifying i know you get someone else to do it yeah what what does that look like in terms of that being your first kind of deal? Was it super scary? Did you have to did you do a lot more due diligence on kind of networking and building your team? What did that look yes. like? Yeah, I'd say the latter was the most important. And so I had probably been doing a lot of networking and team building for about a year when I finally did my first project. So it was a while in the making. And at that point, I was just itching to get going. And I felt like I'd learned everything I could learn within reason from podcasts and literature and that the only way for me to take my knowledge to the next step was to actually do it. Uh, and so that's when I knew I was ready or thought I was ready. And uh, so, yeah, we, we relied pretty heavily on the team that we had built and uh, we were out of state. And for us, we were okay uh, doing out of state investing. We still do that to date because, you know, we knew that we didn't want our business uh, to have us personally involved, you know, swinging a hammer, for example. And that's just not how we wanted to build it. So we built it from day one um, based on our team. And so that's that's what we did. That's awesome. In terms of then going from flips to multifamily, and I, I'm assuming it's, is it value add multifamily? Yep. What, I guess there's lessons learned from the flip and from other flips into the multifamily piece. What did that transition look like? Were you suddenly like trying to find money or was there kind of a, a plan or was it organic or how did that work? Yeah, it was somewhat organic. And, and, and there are some lessons that, that transfer from flipping to multifamily or self-storage. And that's really just building systems and processes and building the right team. And so after doing a, a few residential projects, we had some systems and processes built out for flips and, and smaller residential 
properties. And so we basically took those systems and processes and, and kind of manifested them into the larger commercial properties. And of course, as you get into them and as you do the larger properties, you're going to refine those systems and, and procedures because they, they change and they're different. Um, so, you know, in the beginning, we relied on some of the same team members. So lenders, for example, one of our first lenders is, is one of our biggest lenders now. And it's a, it's a credit union that we work with fairly frequently. Uh, so there was, there was a lot of, um, overlap that that we were able to take advantage of when we when we switched over how did you find your first kind of set of lenders networking uh so just networking with fellow investors and just chatting about who the investor friendly lenders are and and that is certainly a thing because there there are some lenders who sort of understand the ins and outs of investing and understand the strategy and what it is you're looking to do uh and, and you could really trust when they tell you that that they could do x right because generally you're speaking with uh you're not speaking directly with the committee who's approving your loan you're speaking with a broker or a representative of the credit union or bank who's basically telling you here's what i think the committee could do so understanding that difference is, is key because terms could change once you get to committee. So having uh, kind of an investor vetted bank or credit union is huge because you have a little more trust that they're going to do what they say they're going to do. And is, does that include like building relationships with the, the team members that you're kind of connecting with? Um, yeah, beyond, beyond kind of, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, some of our closer lenders, uh, when we're in town, we'll, we'll have coffee or, or dinner or whatnot. And so building those personal relationships are key, especially for some of these local banks and credit unions, they're on the smaller side. So we're not talking mm -hmm. about the regional or the national players. So, uh, you, you genuinely do have one or two contacts within that bank who are your go-to shop. There's not a 1-800, uh, customer service line. Those are your contacts. That's so cool. That's yeah. I haven't looked at credit unions as a. Uh, I've heard you know I've heard them mentioned so many times, but as a as a viable lender, I guess I haven't been down that route in market. That's super interesting. Uh, yeah, in I terms think depending of on uh, this, oh, sorry about that. I no, think no, go right on the state, the certain credit unions don't have to pay a tax, so they're they're able to offer much more competitive terms on deals that they want to lend on. Interesting. Okay, that's really cool. So there you go. Pro tip, talk to your local <laughs> credit union or actually talk to the local market credit union. Exactly. In terms of um, in terms of buying assets, and I know you're in multifamily and storage. What does your kind of analysis of, of an asset look like? Do you have like hard and fast rules that you follow or certain uh, metrics you're looking to, to kind of hit? What does that look like? Yeah, sure. At its highest level, basically what we're trying to do is buy properties for a 20% discount. That's probably the simplest way to put it. So we're going to look at what today's income is, what today's expenses are going to be. Uh, and then we're going to calculate what we think our income is going to be, what we think our expenses are going to be. Because at the end of the day, everybody operates the property differently. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, for example, we're vertically integrated in the self-storage space. And so we have in-house management. So our costs are different. We spend a little more money on certain technology, but we might save some money on property management fees. And so understanding what our expenses are going to look like helps us put together a more accurate pro forma. And once we have that pro forma in place and we... Uh, ascertain what we think the stabilized value of a property is going to be. We basically just take 20% off of that. And that's generally what we shoot to buy that property for. And so I'm crunching numbers on my first multifamily. Um, not sure how big it's going to be yet. There's a, there's a couple of projects I'm looking at. And one of the things I'm, I'm kind of paranoid about or scared about is the, the concept of offering too low or insulting. <laughs> do, how do you, how did you kind of, get through that in the first kind of instance or the first few multifamilies? Yeah, it's tough. And, and so that's a great question. Uh, and, and getting a lot of no's is, is the honest answer. No, no is okay. Yeah. And once you get a bunch of no's, it just becomes second practice. And I'd say a lot of our deals have come from the follow-up uh, and, and come from some of those lower ball-ish offers. And uh, especially in today's market, there's just a lot of properties out there that are a bit overpriced in, in mm -hmm. my opinion. So, um, you know, one thing that we focus on, for example, is letting a property go through its marketing cycle, which is generally 30 to 60 days, and then reaching out to the broker if it's listed, for example, and, uh, and just telling him that, Hey, we're, we're 20 or 25% off of list price. But if the seller would be interested in a conversation about, um, you know, a reduced, uh, offer price, we'd be happy to submit a letter of intent. 
Yeah. So what does that deal flow look like? Is that through like tracking it through Crexy or just, uh, you know, whatever else? Yeah, we're certainly up to date as to what's uh, on market and what's listed. Uh, we do try to do a whole lot of broker relationships and uh, keeping in touch with with the local brokers so that, you know, when and if they do come across an off market listing or pocket listing, uh, we're on some sort of short list and, and we're on varying degrees of short list with yeah. different brokers. We're on short lists of, you know, maybe five people and then we're on short lists with 250 people. Um, but you know, it's still a deal flow. So we're looking at what's on market We're we're trying to get some off market traction from brokers and wholesalers and, and just trying to analyze as much, uh, that comes through our funnel. And, and like I said, I think follow-up is key because at the beginning of a marketing cycle for a property a seller might not be willing to take a 25% discount, but, uh, once we get 45, 60, 75 days in, it could be a different conversation. Mm -hmm. No, I, I like that. I think the broker thing's interesting because I was, uh, you know, terrified of of brokers for ages, and then just by just by getting informed and knowing a little bit of the market and knowing a little bit of the assets and vintage and all that good stuff, being able to go and have conversations with them and they become your best friends because they just know the market inside and out. They know what realistic looks like and not what is listed on a a Crexy or a LoopNet um advert is not yeah. reality so yeah they are certainly the gatekeeper for most commercial deals uh now of course there are still wholesalers and and there are still folks going direct to seller uh but for the most part i'd say at least two-thirds of the commercial properties are sold through a broker whether on market or off market so having those broker relationships i think is uh, is a great idea that's yeah it's so true that's it took me a while to to realize that but like you said the follow-up like having a good crm and it doesn't need to be anything more than a spreadsheet but just having that system to know when to follow up and what to discuss and all that good stuff is is kind of interesting yeah and there's no right answer to how often to follow up or, or when to follow up because every seller is in a different position so you know you could figure out what you're comfortable with how often you're comfortable paying a broker um, so what I do with the brokers who, even if they don't have a listing, I try to follow up with them quarterly or three mm -hmm. times a year, just to kind of stay top of mind, remind them that we're still buying, remind them what our buy box looks like and, um, try as best I can to get any off market, uh, deal flow. So let's talk about fundraising, um, and syndication. What was your, was that purely a scale decision, uh, to start uh, syndicating and, and privately funding fundraising? Yeah, I'd say for the most part, uh, like I said, we started to look at larger assets in the commercial space. And so those came with larger price tags and uh, larger down payments. And so uh, we had to bring a certain amount of cash to the closing table. And so a uh, popular way of doing that is, is through private equity, um, whether that's joint venture, syndications, a fund. Uh, we've done combinations of all of them. And, uh, you know, we were pretty fortunate that a lot of folks in our network had an interest in real estate uh, and saw what we were doing and wanted to get involved on the passive side. So uh, going this route of purchasing slightly larger properties uh, worked out for us in, in the scale that we were striving for uh, and also worked out for a lot of our partners who wanted to be passive, who wanted to invest in real estate. And it gave us the opportunity to be able, some, to, be able to offer uh, some of that meat that was on the bone. What did that first raise look like? Uh, the first one, the first one was probably the easiest because it was the oh, smallest. Really? Wow. Okay. <laughs> and, 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 and those are, you know, usually the, the lenders that you're closest with. So uh, my partner and myself, and we just brought on uh, one investor each. And so, you know, as you can imagine, I think most people, uh, and it might seem daunting at first, but once you get into it, uh, and, and you start really thinking about it. I think most people could probably find one investor in their network. So that was that was probably the easiest. And as we started getting bigger and uh, you're tapping into additional folks in your network, that's when it starts to get a bit more challenging, in my opinion. How, how do you respond to that challenge? Like, what was your kind of, what's your philosophy? Or I guess, what's your route to kind of reaching out, connecting with people, raising yeah, so we take investor relations seriously. So obviously keeping our existing investors uh, as happy as, as we can is key because I think that goes back to the wave and the snowball effect. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think 
most of our new investors have been referrals from our existing investors, whether they're friends or family or whatnot. So I think that's a great way to do it. Uh, and then the other thing we've done is just focusing on uh, content. So we blog, we send out newsletters, uh, post some social media content, and just informing people and reminding people that what we do is invest in real estate and we're a private equity firm that um, accepts investors. And, and that surprisingly gets a lot of folks to reach out. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, I, I was at a seminar um, a, a couple of months ago, a couple of weeks ago, sorry, and um, we were talking about this. We had a whole session on uh, fundraising. And for me, it was like, it feels, is it icky? It feels icky, right? And I'm going to have to do it soon. It's going to have to be a, a conversation around uh, fundraising when I'm, when I'm ready to scale up. And um, there's I, certainly a mindset shift there. Yeah. You well, know, the, from they're not doing, you, you know, your, your partners and investors are not doing you a favor. Exactly. Um, and I don't want to say that, that you're doing them a favor, but you are presenting them with an opportunity to earn a return on their investment. It's exactly that. It's an opportunity to say, hey, this is something we can both win at. The other thing I like what you say is um, like people reinvesting and uh, and sticking around. And um, I work in the, the commercial world and it's very much easier to keep a customer than get a new one. And sure. so keeping your customers happy, your investors, is a really powerful message. Um, we did an episode a few weeks ago, which was all we, we kind of ran through a list of things to ask a real estate uh, invest investor or fund or whoever someone in real estate that's pitching to you and the top question was can i speak to one of your investors and if they if it's a no that's kind of interesting right that is an interesting yep so um yeah i i love that i love that. and i think that's the shift that i've gone through in the last couple of months is is like seeing it differently and i say that as an lp already so it's it, i it's silly to go well you're asking people for money well no i've 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 invested. So I, I've done that. Um, super interesting. When you, I guess, when you present deals, what's your, what's, what do you kind of present? Is it just a, um, a memorandum with some kind of numbers? Do you go super in depth? Do you do past performance? What does that look like? Uh, all of the above. So it, it really depends on the investor. Uh, there are some investors who could care less about the deal. They could care less about the asset class. They just care about myself my partner, basically the operators of the deal, and they see it as they're investing in us, which uh, in my opinion, you know, I'm an LP in some deals as well. That's what I look at because I'm really investing in that operator. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in reality, even as an LP, I'm not underwriting the deal to the same extent that the operator is. So I'm putting some degree of trust into the operator, into that underwriting and into that past performance. Uh, but to your point, we also go in, in, in much more depth with some other investors who, who may trust us, but want to know more about the deal. Maybe this is their first passive investment. Uh, they need sort of an overview of what that looks like. They need to see the numbers. They need to see your analysis. So, uh, so we do put together a memorandum. We'll do a zoom or a webinar, uh, whether it's with a group of investors or one-on-one -on -one and basically whatever, whatever the opportunity dictates. That's really interesting. In terms of, do you then, um, so the other thing we talked about was red flags of of potential investors. So people that are going to want their money back quickly or, you know, it's it's their life savings and you kind of don't want to take someone's life savings, that kind of thing. How do you vet your investors? Yeah, and, and that's a good point. Life is too short to put yourself in a predicament of having folks uh, unhappy with you. So I'm very straightforward with our investors as to, the projected hold time. And a very common question is how liquid is this investment? If I need this money in two years, but we're not ready to refinance or sell, can I, can I withdraw that money? Uh, and really the answer is no. I mean, there's some opportunity to perhaps sell your shares to another LP or, or to us ourselves. And I'd like to think that we could accommodate that and make that happen when the time comes, but there's certainly no guarantee. And so one of the downsides of an investment like this is it's just not as liquid as something like the stock market. So um, being very careful to explain that to investors, I think is important because the last thing that I want to do is have unhappy investors a couple of years from now, uh, because, you know, this is also a small circle and, and word gets around fast. So that is something we do. And 
Um, you know, just making sure our investors fully understand the deal, uh, what the business plan looks like, what the return structure looks like. Every deal is different as far as when distributions typically start. Sometimes mm-hmm. they start a quarter or two ac- after acquisition, and sometimes it's a deeper value add and distributions are projected to start a year later. So just ensuring that the investor fully understands what they're signing, I think is, is very important. Yeah. Getting that, um, you know, I, I work in business and I've, I've sold tons and tons of different kind of deals and, and stuff in business. And it's it's the exact same thing. You want your customer or investor to be comfortable and happy and you want to operate with integrity and transparency. Like no one wants to no one wants to sign on the dotted line and then feel bad about it on either side of the table. Yeah. And at the end of the day, look, I mean, what we're doing, I think, uh, is it, it's great, but I'm not looking to mislead somebody into investing. I mean, that that's just, it, it's not in anybody's best interest. Absolutely. hundred percent. Yeah. That repeat customer uh, piece as well. So in terms of structuring a deal, and I know there's a million ways to do that um, with a, a GP and an LP, what do you have a typical favorite kind of structure you go to, or is it kind of asset dependent? Uh it's certainly deal dependent. I'd say our go-to structure is is probably the traditional 70-30 split between the GPs and the LPs with the LPs getting 70% of the equity and then a preferred return somewhere between 6 and 8%. So we usually settle right in the 7% range. Um, and then, of course, all the upside at the back end. And a common question we get is, hey, is our equity diluted upon a refinance or return a capital event? The answer is always no, at least as it pertains to us. Uh, so that's our go-to structure. And we'll look to amend that slightly if the deal is a little smaller or a little larger than usual. Uh, we've done one deal with some some debt where investors didn't get any equity, but they had a fixed payment that was much higher than the cash on cash return and that just fit their goals so um yeah certainly deal dependent that's awesome in terms of the legal side and that's your background what was the was there anything surprising or what was the kind of learning curve for you to um pick up the kind of legalities of that (laughs) yeah I, i mean there is certainly a learning curve there and especially for somebody who doesn't have a legal background it is good to get as much education as you can about yeah. that before you jump into it uh and so for me it was a, it was a bit easier but still a learning curve and so the securities law is uh it, it's an in-depth code and there's a lot of requirements there and making sure that you're you're working with the right securities attorneys i think is important attorneys that have done this in the past we got some referrals from fellow investors for attorneys who did not specialize in securities. And when we spoke with them, uh, you could tell, or at least I could. And, uh, you know, those are the folks who I wouldn't necessarily want drafting our PPM or our legal documents because they might do a good job on it, but a a securities attorney is just going to know all the nuances and all Mm -hmm. the ins and outs of what needs to be in there, what doesn't need to be in there. Uh, So I'd say just being cognizant of who you retain to do your securities work, because undoubtedly you're going to need to retain an attorney to do that uh, and and just ensuring that they have an in-depth background in securities. Yeah. And if the, if, and when the SEC come knocking, you kind of want to have that lined up, right? It's not something you want to be (laughs) scrambling for. Uh, So that's really, really interesting. Um, In terms of then moving into storage, was that alongside multifamily or was there kind of a conscious decision to move into the storage space? Yeah, it it was. And so when we uh, shifted our focus from residential real estate, uh, we wanted to focus on commercial. And so the obvious transition was multifamily. uh, And we knew or at least thought that multifamily was the most competitive space because that's what most folks graduate Mm -hmm. on to do from residential. So we wanted a little something to diversify ourselves and uh, to be able to increase our deal flow. So, you know, we were aware of some of the other uh, investments such as self-storage, mobile home parks, uh, net leases and things like that. And uh, for us, you know, we like the diversification that storage gave us in, in that it's basically four walls and a roof. It's, uh, a bit more recession resistant than some other asset classes. It's, it's certainly not recession proof. I don't think anything is, but uh, you know, a, a lot of the factors that drive self-storage occupancy are 
uh, are things that are a little more common during a recession, such as displacement, uh, divorce, downsizing. So those were all drivers for us in choosing self-storage. How's the market um, managed or handled kind of the changes over the last six months in terms of storage? Yeah, so I'd say in 2021 and 2022, self-storage occupancy was at all-time highs. So you were seeing 95, 98% occupancy across the board, which was substantially higher than what occupancy had historically been, which is generally in the mid to high 80% range. Uh, and so I'd say in the past six months, we've returned a bit more to normal in that mid to high 80% range. And you know, one of the things that we're doing to, to combat you know, slightly lower occupancy it's just rate managing our existing clientele. Uh, so another one of the good things about self-storage is that leases are usually month to month, whereas on the residential or the multifamily side, you're generally looking at a one year or two year lease. Mm -hmm. So we're able to pace ourselves with inflation just a little better because as inflation is going up or as our costs are going up, we're able to pass that on to our clients j just a bit more. Uh, and certainly you have to do that within reason because you don't want to continue to decrease occupancy. But it's fairly common for us to increase rents about 5% every six to nine months. Wow. Okay. That's really interesting. And why, I wonder why it was so, uh, so high occupancy during COVID. Was that people just needed to move all the stuff out of their house? Yeah, there was just so much moving around. There was so much shifting yeah, between 2020 and 2022. So self-storage was, I mean, it was just hard to get a unit. I mean... Uh, boat and RV parking was flying off the shelves and you had folks who obviously only store their boats, let's say in the colder months, and they would continue paying for their spot during those colder mm -hmm. months because they knew if they gave it up and they stopped paying for it, it wouldn't be there when they needed to store it. Wow. Oh, that's interesting. People uh, were in buying terms... toys, so they yeah, need that's to put true. them somewhere. <laughs> to try and store them somewhere. Uh, <laughs> in terms of managing um, and operating assets, who, do you have a team that does that? Is it kind of a general team or one per property or what does that look like? Yeah, on the self-storage side, we are vertically integrated. So we do that in-house and that was mm -hmm. a decision that we made early on. We looked at some of the third-party management firms and we looked at some of the call centers that were available um, and we made the decision to take it in-house. We thought we cared about the assets more than any manager would and, and we thought we could do it uh, a bit less expensively and and with not as many headaches that, that might come along with self-managing, let's call it multifamily. Uh, so we have a team of uh, four employees currently, one based here in the U.S. and three overseas. And so we handle the calls internally. And uh, on the ground, we don't have anybody based on site from nine to five, let's say. But we do have lots of maintenance folks, and we call them boots on the ground, who go to the site. We call it once a week to do a lock mm -hmm. audit or to sweep out a unit after somebody moves out. And then obviously some contractors to do some larger jobs. Very cool. What about multifamily? Do you use um, in-market um, managers? Yeah, we, we use local third-party property management. How is it managing the managers? There's different challenges in different markets and with different managers. Uh, you know, we, we have a couple of rock star property managers and those are the markets that we're now focusing more on because mm -hmm. those are the markets that we could get our asset to perform better in. So, uh, you know, I mean, that's something that, again, getting recommendations from investors are, are key and just seeing how you work with, with that individual, right? And, and how much uh, babysitting they need, for lack of a better term. No, I really like that. Um, Michael, thank you so much for your, your time today. How, how can people get in touch with you? Yeah, sure. I'd say the best way is to visit our website, nextplayinvestments.com. Uh, from there, you can schedule a call with me. You can shoot me an email. And we're publishing a book uh, about the blueprint for passive investing. Uh, and so I'd be happy to send a free copy to anybody that reaches out. And that just provides, whether it's a first-time passive investor or a long-time passive investor, with just an A to Z guide about what passive investing looks like, what are the steps required, and, and what they come to expect. Very, very cool. We'll put a link to that in the in the show notes for sure. Perfect. Um and uh yeah, do do check it out. Uh, and do you have any social links? Yeah, sure. So you could uh you could reach me at, at pretty much any social media site. I'd say uh Facebook is where I post most of my content and uh that's just under Next Play Investments, so happy to post that as well. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time today. Appreciate it. Thanks, Sean. Cool, and we'll be back next week. 
Thank you for listening to Invest Stories. If you like what you've heard, please consider sharing and writing a five-star review. 